Hello. I'd like to take a look now at a question that I've had over the years, and I'm sure many people have. And in fact, it's been dated for eon. I mean, addressed for eons. And that is, um, what aspects of our personalities are genetically inherited, and how so, particularly? Um, for instance, put another way. How much of our lives, our personalities, are nature versus nurture? We've been going around in circles on this for a long time, and some people quite sure one way or the other, or, or on maybe a mix, they say. So I'd like to bring up my own thinking on this, but... Before I do, I will say it's not from a, quote, officially trained position. I don't have a degree, you know, so to speak, in psychology or medicine. Um, my, quote, training at age 60 now comes from things like life experience, having been raised the way I was, by who I was, having gone to the military at 18, to become a physician and have that um, oh diverted to other channels um, having attended to West Point and afterward my quote training in psychology especially having come from some time spent with two different psychoanalysts both medical doctors and one of them in no small town, but um, San Diego, California. And this practitioner having graduated from no small university and Jewish and um, of quite some renown, but I was very lucky to have very good insurance and he was very young of age. At any rate, too, I've studied after that point in time much and pondered much and written much on this topic. So that's where I'm coming from, my perspective. Um, I've read viewpoints on a number of, of uh, views on this and studied things from a Bo Buddhist and religious perspective too, and from a variety of religious perspectives. Again, that's where I'm coming from as I bring up this material. So the question is a very germane, important one, I think. How much is inherited genetically versus experience, nature versus nurture? I think most psychologists and psychiatrists, for instance, and others in other fields, educational or whatever, as, mo as well as our mother, father, grandparents, and ministers would all say, they would like to say it's a mix of both. And I'd like to take a look at that, just how much of a mix, how much to one extent or the other. Maybe we ought to even ask whether a lot of our struggles in life are not just a mix of a 50-50 nature, but maybe a 90-10 nature. Maybe, in fact, most of our struggles are due to how we were raised and where we were raised, and what schooling we got or didn't get, and what quality, what religious training we got or not, and what quality, uh, how empathetically we were brought up in general, how loved we were, and by parents or grandparents, uh, whether we ever joined the military or not and got certain experiences, and whether it was field duty or office duty, and whether we ever got married or not, and implications either way, had children or not, ever got ill early in life, let's say became blind at an early age or lost limbs in a war or other, or had diabetes and lost legs, and, and then gained from, uh, from having uh, struggled through all this to come out the other end, hopefully, or at least halfway through, and so, in general, I'm talking about uh, 
a lot of life experiences here. What factor did that all play? Did we also grow up in an urban environment, L.A., Los Angeles, um, Chicago, New York? Or did we grow up uh, carefree and happy in the country or in a tiny town somewhere? in a rural area in general, and so to speak let loose to play. And at what uh, time frame did this happen, before or after computer era, before or after cell phone era? Did we go to daycare or not? All these questions and more, in fact, having a big impact, I think. And do we live today in a home, or did we um, ever have a home? Did we grow up poor, wealthy? Um, what kind of employment did our parents have? Did we grow up working class, middle class, or above? All of these, I think, having big impacts. And finally, I would bring up another question. And that is, what kind of body type do we have? Are we rotund, average, mesomorphic, or are we tall, thin, skinny, ectomorphic? And what impact does that have, then, that alone? Of a, yes, genetically uh, inheritable nature, but what impact does that have on our personality as per certain aspects being, quote, inherited by body type inheritance? And, um, and yet another thing, um, what about the genetic inheritance of our sex, our ge our um, gender. What effect does our gender have on our personality traits one way or the other? Are we more skewed thus by genetically inheriting our body type and gender and that alone perhaps? Rather than what I would say ab abnormal factors that we might possibly inherit like uh, the search for uh, brain lesions, let's say, or the wiring in our brains going amok, or maybe we have a brain uh, that is larger than some others. And what about um, it being claimed that some people who have, quote, mental illnesses can be seen in brain scans to have uh, ventricles that are smaller or more deteriorated? Was that inherited or did stress cause this? How many, quote, double-blind studies, test tube studies, has been done to ascertain whether these um, ventricles in the brain, if smaller than average, uh, came from a genetic inheritance or from stress? You might even call PTSD. Traumatic life experiences uh, in childhood or later. All of these and more questions. Now, it's always been the question in every psychologist's mind, everybody's mind in general, I think, every psychiatrist's mind, of um, what exactly is inheritable or isn't as per various personality characteristics. And I would have to say, having um, been a analytic patient once and other um, training received, a lot of reading, discussion, that my conclusion is there aren't that many things at all that we do or don't inherit of a personality nature, an emotional predisposition, shall we say. Um, I would boil it down, in my view, to simply a few things, actually. For instance, what is the, our degree of proclivity, our predisposition to anxiety? And, uh, and then the question being, how much of this is nature versus nurture, experience versus genetics? And genetics as per uh, deficiencies in the brain or nerve endings of, or axons in the brain? Or are we talking genetics as applied to how we inherited our body type and gender? So, for instance, Rollo May, a psychoanalyst, has written on anxiety a lot. I can't remember the exact titles, but it's easily looked up. 
Again, Freud, too, talking greatly about anxiety and spending much time talking about the concept of defense mechanisms as combating anxiety. To Freud, uh, discredited somewhat for whatever reasons, but still quite valid in my opinion uh, for overall views, um, thought anxiety the kingpin topic. And thus, uh, we might say, uh, something very, very important to discuss as a major factor and whether uh, and to what degree something is inherited. Then the next question I would ask is how much um, aggression or lack of it is inherited? And for instance, there are people who have written on the topic of, quote, sociopathy. Um, which um, some might say is a lack of empathy. How much of this is nature and nurture, uh, genetics versus not? And, um, for instance, how much of uh, empathy or the lack of it is simply um, somewhat genetically inherited by our gender, whereby women arguably, at least until recent times, are um, said to be, by some, to be better nurturers of children, more empathetic because that's how they are wired. They're the ones, until recently, who did most of the child rearing, and they're the ones, even today, who have to gestate the child for nine months, not the males. So again, what degree of aggression, or shall we say empathy level too, is inherited or not. In fact, um, there are some writers on sociopathy who say that you can even look at a photo of a person and somewhat tell whether they are uh, a killer or not, a sociopath, someone lacking in empathy. And they present photos in a book or books of mug photos of some big criminal uh, types, so to speak, and we're supposed to try and judge whether we can tell by the photos alone whether these people have uh, sociopathic tendencies or, shall we say, inheritance for um, uh, low levels of empathy. Now, for instance, too, um, consider the realm of the, quote, animal world, where certain animals are divided into either carnivores or herbivores or omnivores, eating both meat or plants. And with certain carnivores, then, this being, by the way, genetically inherited, there being more of a tendency for high aggression levels and the eating of other animals, which you might call to an extent, on a human level, um, uh, the inheritance of sociopathy. We uh, would probably consider someone a sociopath if they eat other animals uh, that are called humans, especially. And the people of India at one point probably called everyone else who ate animals, um, like cows in particular, sociopaths, uh, for eating cows. But at any rate, the um, topic of um, whether or not someone is a carnivore, I mean an animal is a carnivore or a herbivore, is pretty clear-cut and genetic in nature. And thus, uh, wolves, sharks, bears are genetically inherited animals uh, as per eating meat. And to do this, they single out the weakest in societies that they call society uh, to eat those, to survive. And they can't help it. It's genetically inherited. Now, other animals do not do this. Elephants, for instance. And many animals that we greatly revere in daily life, oh, like dogs and uh and horses, for instance, 
If we look too, this can arguably be a genetic trait in one direction or the other, uh, whereby, say, you have your pit bulls on the one hand, or Doberman pinchers, and then you have your golden retrievers, excellent for, for um, blind people. And you have, uh, say, your thoroughbreds, Spanish Arabian thoroughbreds, perhaps quite nervous by disposition. Then you have your Shetland ponies and Clydesdale horses. You could flick a stone at a thoroughbred, thoroughbred horse and it would run off skittishly. Um, and on the other hand, you could um, um, be quite confident to put your child on a Shetland pony. These animals are not nervous at all. So then we're talking that these um, animals like dogs and horses inherit tendencies for anxiety and aggression. And this is what I bring up then, that in my opinion, these are two kingpin things that affect our personality greatly, and we ought to be looking at as uh, perhaps the major factors that are inherited or not inherited. And then finally, if we're not talking level of anxiety or predisposition and level of aggression, or shall we say level of sociopathy or level of um, empathy, level of love being able to be accorded, what about a third factor and probably the only other major factor I would look at? Um, except for one last one I'll bring up. And that is, what about um, level of intelligence? How much intelligence is inheritable? Of course, this is a very, very sticky issue in many ways. And some have tried to prove, statistically and otherwise, their point of view. But my own personal view, really this probably is a, a moot point. Um... For, for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, it's probably quite discredited that a certain race or races of people are less intelligent than others. And secondly, because I think factors like how you were raised and what kind of schooling or, or such you didn't receive or did receive, uh, and what injuries you may have received later in life of a physical nature that caused you to become bitter or alternatively to um, double up and work through in your mind and quote come out the other end a much better person than someone never handicapped. All of these being very much more important I think in my mind than any um, quote inheritance factor on intelligence or, or what factor inheritance plays on intelligence or whether even the degree of one's brain size, whether we're trying to specify how much brain volume Einstein had, for instance, as opposed to others. Where did Einstein's supposed intelligence come from? I once read, for instance, a biography on Einstein, and there was scant attention, very little attention paid to his childhood. Uh, what made him who he was? Was it his brain size, or was it his experiences? How much love did he receive compared to the average child? What factors went into him that we don't know about that aren't written down very frequently, that aren't uh, available to us for scrutiny? Of course, this can translate too to um, the question of whether women inherit less um, types of intelligence than men, whether they inherit more, quote, emotional intelligence, feeling intelligence, love intelligence, and men inherit more logical capacity. For these days, there's more and more of a push for women to be trained better in mathematics and sciences. And then sometimes they do quite well. But that the question then is, how much does society encourage this, as opposed to encouraging women to play with dolls as children? Because that's what children, if females, are supposed to do, supposedly. So, again, so many questions. Now, you could also argue 
um, some other factors here, and I'll bring up too. How much have, um, shall we say, attention to detail to the extent of being obsessive-compulsive is inheritable? But then, in my mind, this being pretty much an anxiety issue, and surely I think the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual in Psychology addressing OCD as an anxiety issue. Uh, thus, um, the question being then, how much proclivity do we have to anxiety by genetic reasons? And uh, is this of a um, matter of brain cells or brain injury, or is it a matter of um, our genetics um, uh, predisposing us to be male or female, and then a lot of anxiety coming by body size and uh, in that matter. So this isn't so simple, of course. And finally, I think the only other factor that has ever come into my mind of a big nature is um, the degree of inheritability of what they call PTSD and schizophrenia and bipolar, so to speak. To what extent um, are we um, subject to being traumatized more than some, or uh, shall we say, more likely to have a racing mind, or what some would say, mood fluctuations, but I would say more of a, uh, of a mindset that is uh, flighty, say, too sped up. Does this come from market anxiety that some don't compensate for the same way as others, or is it largely genetic? And then the issue of schizophrenia, and so to speak. Some say that this doesn't exist. Um, schizophrenia being defined as the presence of delusions, hallucinations, and I suppose some would say disorganized thinking. But then the question being, how do you define a delusion, basically? in my mind, being the kingpin issue. How do you define a delusion? Where does it come from? To what extent is that genetic versus learned, shall we say? Learned by one's parents or even learned from society, from what you might call propaganda. Um, if propaganda is strong enough to reinforce what you might call a delusion, do we even have a delusion then, or is it simply propaganda that is permanent in nature and very hard to shuck off? Because in today's age, it's so hard to shuck off uh, propaganda, coming from a variety of sources, of course, like TV, uh, movies, music, media, and the workplace. To name some major factors. And then we might also add our uh, educational training and whatever religious training we receive, too. Now, there are a couple points I'd like to bring up that is not much brought up in psychology and psychiatry, for instance. And that is um, the topic of how genetics affects our body type and how that, in turn, affects our predisposition to being easily traumatized and um, having perhaps a proclivity, a tendency towards higher than average levels of both anxiety and reactivity, I would call it, or skittishness, or the tendency to be a flincher. Um, for instance, George Carlin, the irreverent comedian, has done a video on women and um, in his opinion, how unlucky in some ways they are to be women when it comes to being vulnerable to violence. Um, and he's pointing out that in his opinion, this is largely because of their body size. Well, then, um, also a book, PTSD for Dummies, uh, talking about trauma, basically, post-traumatic stress disorder, arguing that women are more predisposed and more likely to be diagnosed as having PTSD on the basis of their smaller body size. And I might also add my two cents worth uh, fewer muscles and it being not permitted for them to carry weapons uh, 
uh, at the ready, shall we say, in society, in all places. So, all of that being a factor here. And finally, too, um, the fact that ectomorphs, tall people, in my opinion, as a tall man, are more predisposed to be um, of a high anxiety nature and more reactive nature uh, to a considerable degree simply because they're more vulnerable to injury and because society says they can't carry weapons and uh, in the open, in front of them, ready. Uh, from childhood on, thus far more vulnerable to bullying and that's setting them up right there for PTSD right there. PTSD from bullying alone. And of course, too, what about the factor that suddenly comes to mind of immigrants? I believe I read once that uh, one person said 80% of immigrants have mental illness issues, uh, shall we say emotional issues, from being immigrants. Well, is this largely genetic or half and half? Or is it basically a phenomenon whereby mm, they don't fit in in so many ways? They have different moral codes, different ways of approaching things, different defense mechanisms, and find it very difficult being the minority. And for instance, my mother is an immigrant who came here at age 12. And when she came to the classroom, knowing no English, she was called a Nazi by some children because the last place of her residence was a relocation camp in Germany before coming by ship for 12 or 14 days to America and finally to Detroit. So don't you think this caused her a lot of difficulties, to say the least? Um, she was an immigrant and thus... To what extent does that predispose a person uh, who is called a Nazi in this case by some children to have struggles, of course? How much of that thus is genetic? And I might add uh, that she inherited um, um, her race, by the way, her race having been Polish in origin, originally so. Um, did she inherit some struggles from having the genetic inheritance of the Polish race in her? And two, what factor does how many allies we have play in our level of anxiety? Well, for instance, if we're a tall, skinny, thin person, quite vulnerable to injury, we might spend a lot of time in bookish pursuits and never play sports either and never date much. Um, and then the question being, how many allies do we have as children? And this alone contributing to higher levels of, shall we say, anxiety or skittishness or reactivity when under pressure on the playground. For if we don't have many allies, that alone would cause us higher than average levels of anxiety, wouldn't it? And, and furthermore, when under pressure, that we might not just handle that anxiety in a calm manner, but in a reactive manner, because we feel our life is in, under threat. Whereas otherwise, those who have allies may also feel uh, anxiety, but if they have allies, they take things in a more measured uh, manner and plan more. And as to the concept of a factor in schizophrenia, so to speak, being disorganized thinking, I would throw out my two cents worth and say that from my personal experience, anyone under pressure without adequate resources is going to have disorganized thinking, naturally, because they fear their life is in, in danger or that their health is in danger, or that something they own or some loved one of theirs is in danger of loss or injury. And when this happens, 
life is not going to feel so comfortable and our thinking will become disorganized to one extent or another. We might even have, quote, a brief reactive psychotic episode or more, a psychotic break as some would call it, coming up with wishful thinking maybe uh, to cope with something that is so terrifying. And hopefully this this uh, um, being resolved in time. But as for this concept then of, quote, schizophrenia, basically and largely involving delusions, well, I would point out two things or three things from my personal experience and views, and they're, they're these. First of all, who is to say what a delusion is or isn't? And for instance, a Dr. Grande, a psychologist with many shows on YouTube, had a video out that I watched the other day on the topic of what is denial versus a delusion. And, um, and in general, what do you call a, a delusion? In my opinion, a delusion is a denial. But And then... The next question is, who does not have at least one denial in their life? And thus, who does not have at least one delusion? And thus, finally, who is not a schizophrenic on this planet, if you want to carry it to that logical end? And thus, making the whole concept of schizophrenia quite uh, questionable and even in a few minds or more ludicrous. Um, so, this, this for food for thought right there. And finally, too, from my reading, it has been said by some that um, it is, quote, beyond dispute that statistically it's shown that the so-called schizophrenic has a higher than average uh, level of this trait being diagnosed in family members, especially parents and siblings and it dribbling out to a lesser extent statistically in time as you look at further and further generations apart. But I had a thought half a year ago that blew my mind. And it's this. If we're to define schizophrenia mainly as delusions held, and furthermore, if we honestly say who doesn't have at least one delusion, it hit me half a year ago something very profound in my mind anyway, and that is and, and that is this. Is it possible that our parents or one parent or some other close relative inculcated in us a delusion or what some call now a limiting belief that is very, very fixed? And um, And then does this, quote, limiting belief or delusion come from our parental training? Or is it genetic in nature from uh, a lesion on the brain or something wrong with our nerve axons? Or something, quote, uh, not yet found to be viewable in CAT scans, but maybe someday will be viewable? All food for thought, I would mention. For instance, what if your parents were of the, quote, religion or cult of Scientology. Don't you think your children, as children of Scientology parents, would have been inculcated or taught or persuaded to have a certain point of view that many people not Scientology-oriented would call a delusion? Well, then, are these children of the Scientologist parents inheriting a brain disorder? Or are they being taught something that is delusional in nature? Um, or let's say you were brought up in some other manner that some would say involved the teaching of a delusion to children. And it's very hard later in life perhaps for the child to break free of that if they join organizations their whole life that reinforce this limiting belief or delusion. So then, does this, quote, delusion get perpetuated and not rooted out because they marry someone with this same predisposed view 
and attend organizations that keep reinforcing it and keep reading books that reinforce it too, in part for the social benefits. So again, how much of that would be of a genetically um, brain-disordered nature versus what they're taught and can't break free of? Now, some would say the word memes exists to cover some of this. M-E-M-E-S. And I haven't read that much about it, but I have been acquainted with the concept as uh, it talking of how certain societies in general teach certain things to its society members called memes, if you will, uh, as, a, as a way of conceptualizing certain key things that are suppositions or premises were taught in particular societies. And, uh, of course, then uh, this um, involving things like our religion and our approach to learning. Oh, let's say, are we taught the Western views on religion or Eastern views? Christianity or Buddhism, say? And in learning, are we taught um, to emphasize logic or are we taught to emphasize intuition and less use of words, as the Buddhists uh, teach? And even in our religions, you could say how much of it is legalistic versus love-oriented. And so as a child, we're raised, if under the religious view, um, legalistically religious to one extent versus loving religious oriented on the opposite extent. And then uh, the question being, what is the impact and is this arguably genetic or largely um, taught. Taught, you might say, by being taught a limiting belief or, or misconception that is very fixed and arguably a delusion. Are they being taught delusions and can't break out of it later then? And what about um, how a child is raised concerning their sexuality and their view on the philosophical concept of free will, free will versus determinism. Well, for instance, with this latter, it's been my observation after many, many years that the key component to being vulnerable to shaming and guilt and shame in general and perfectionism has a lot to do with your viewpoint on free will versus determinism. And the free will being um, of the opinion that you can help everything you did and so you deserve a lot of shame if you were a bad boy. Versus the determinist on the other hand saying I couldn't help but stick my hand in the cookie jar so I don't deserve shame. And um, in some ways this being a much healthier way of living in the long run. And perfectionism, too, being of a nature perhaps of uh, catastrophizing and uh, it having a um, philosophical underpinning. And then, of course, our views on sexuality being largely taught, I believe, from our parents and, and their views. And let's say they had a limiting belief or even, quote, delusional view on matters of sexuality, well then, as an adult, especially, can you argue that the child turned into adult has a delusion concerning certain matters about sexuality and is thus a schizophrenic? Or are we talking simply the way they were raised and never broke out of? For a way of um, who they married or, or what churches they may attend or not attend and what literature they read or not read, etc and what programming they view on TV, and what movies they go to, and whether they go to bars or not, where they socialize, and how. How much of their views on sexuality, then, are inherited versus genetic? And, well, I hesitate to bring things up um, without a great long outline. I'll bring up a little out of order here, the concept of bipolar disorder, 
Um, the tendency amongst people diagnosed as such to have higher than average levels of, uh, shall we say, rapid thinking uh, and other factors like less sleep and more uh, sexual escapades sometimes and uh, maybe a few other factors and uh, periods of depression too when, um, let's say, in my opinion, they give up completely on life after much frustration only to later, say, pick things up again and try again, shifting again to a non-depressed manner. How much of this is genetic versus simply being both under a lot of pressure in general in the modern area and maybe getting hit upside the head with certain key um, difficult events, especially with no money in the bank these days and no pensions? And finally, what about um, whether certain types of people are not using certain defense mechanisms to cope with stress that others are. Now, at this point, I would bring up what you'll never see in any book, especially a psychology book, but I bring it up by way of personal observation. And that is, and that is this, that I have rarely seen a big, swarthy ex prison man convicted of a violent crime of having what you would call a predisposition to bipolar disorder as it's diagnosed. And these people tend to look pretty cool as a cucumber to me, the opposite of what would ever be diagnosed as bipolar, or shall we say um, uh, running like a chicken with its head cut off, and then sometimes perhaps depressed on the other end. Well, is this, quote, ex-convict violent man uh, calm by way of genetics? Or are there other factors, other mitigating factors, that he's using to combat anxiety that the, quote, bipolar person isn't using? And such as his muscles and uh, his lack of empathy whereby maybe, just possibly, this, quote, violent man has, as a way of coping with anxiety, um, his muscles and uh, something in the back of, a mi of his mind that says, um, I know how to get even with so-and-so by just killing them or doing them in, doing tit-for-tat that a, quote, bipolar person would never do in a million years. In fact, it's a, another observation of mine that people who are, quote, diagnosed as bipolar, so to speak, are by and far the most empathetic people. And that those, arguably, who are much calmer are the most likely to be called sociopathic or lacking in empathy, in, at least. And that they have other ways of coping, again, uh, with muscles, say, or violence when on, on call or when desirable. In fact, case in point, when I was um, working in the military as a lieutenant, one of my fellow lieutenants said that he coped with a company commander who gave both of us a lot of difficulty in our first jobs as platoon leaders by telling the company commander that um, if this man didn't get off his back, he would kill him. In other words, basically, I suppose, uh, throw a grenade in his tent one day, say, on the battlefield. Well, wouldn't you know that company commander got off his back pronto? My point being that certain point, certain people would resort to this, would resort to sociopathy or saber-rattling, if you will, uh, with that in the background, as a way of coping with anxiety and stressors, and other people wouldn't dream of doing this. So, I think he would definitely not be using um, racing-mindedness and, and the concept of bipolar in general to cope with anxiety. He had other means. He had violence to cope with anxiety, or he had in the back of his mind that this was an option, at least. You might also say that certain people have in the back of their mind that 
they could always resort to combating poverty or stressors in general by, quote, robbing a bank, whereas others would never dream of robbing a bank. Others would never dream, too, of doing something, quote, dumb in general to uh, cope with anxiety from stressors and never dream of wanting to take the risk of going to prison or just basically injuring people in general. So then the question again is, how much are some people coping with anxiety um, through sociopathic defense mechanisms, if you will, violence as a defense mechanism, or uh, low empathy and its aftermath as a defense mechanism, while others don't have that as an option, either because they're smart enough to not want to end up in prison unnecessarily, or they were too, quote, well-loved to have that as an option, as I would facetiously bring out. You could say then that um, being too well-loved deprives one of an option of a, using uh, sociopathy violence as a defense mechanism, and so you're more predisposed to coping with life in other ways, like, like um, having racing-mindedness, and more likely than to be called bipolar. And then, is bipolar thus, even on this accord alone, genetic, or does it have to do with that person's lack of other defense mechanisms to cope with anxiety? I bring up one final note that I've observed when I was again in the military, that many people coped with anxiety by addressing things in a, quote, obsessive-compulsive manner, planning things out very, 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 very much in detail. For instance, the military was very much akin to having regulations on anything and everything. We had at headquarters, uh, for instance, a bookshelf with probably at least 10 feet space for uh, manuals in binders on regulations for everything. You couldn't even um, probably, quote, go to the bathroom without there being a regulation on how to do it and what type of toilet paper to use in the bathroom. And so, my point being that people using obsessive compulsiveness, especially in that setting, were probably the calmest people around, including myself at one point when I was highly predisposed to that mode of thinking and operating too. And that, on the other hand, when I wasn't so, quote, obsessive, uh, my mind was much more um, skittish and um, racing mindedness to cope with anxiety. And thus, my point being that the use of violence and too much attention to detail and um, planning can be great ways to cope that the person diagnosed with bipolar disorder probably isn't using, and third, that the bipolar person often is of slighter build, in my observational, um, um, that's my opinion anyway, that the most swarthy um, muscular people are the least likely to get called bipolar because they're the most likely to be able to defend themselves and the least likely to be injured from a punch. So again, the quote bipolar person supposedly having a large genetic component to this may just possibly be lacking certain other defense mechanisms that certain other people have and thus on this basis alone rarely get called bipolar because they have other ways of coping with anxiety that the other person doesn't have available, either because of their body build or, or empathy level that precludes certain things. Or, again, maybe they don't have uh, an obsessive-compulsive bent to cope. Whereas, um, it, in general, I have seen a very large um, bifurcation, if you will, between the person diagnosed as bipolar versus the person obsessive. I just don't see that many highly um, quick-thinking people, if you will, who are also obsessive at the same time. I kind of see it more on an um, opposite spectrum nature. <laughs>
Um, at least this is something to consider and evaluate. Now I know that what I've been bringing up for the last hour is not the best organized, but if I tried to organize it all I'd have to say it would never come out. I'd never get the gumption and have the time and energy to do it. So I'll just have to beg your um, patience here that you um, that I can only present what uh, my are my observations and experiences um, as is, shall we say. Take it or leave it, I suppose. Um, and again, I don't have a degree in this field, but again, I would offer that perhaps that gives you a different perspective than someone from the cookie-cutter degree position. And finally, I would say that I'm not trying to say I believe I'm 100% sure and am dogmatically putting out any particular position. But given how things have trended in the past 30 years, say, away from the view of um, we're needing to take personal responsibility and um, try and get to the bottom of things, uh, examine with therapy and depth therapy analysis, versus today's approach of 10 sessions of cognitive therapy, if lucky, and a pharmaceutical approach to mute emotions, and more emphasis now on genetics than ever as a factor, I'm just kind of bringing up and scratching my head whether we've gone way too far in one direction and not the other. For matters of convenience, expediency, and finances, and lack of insurance benefits, too, and desire for quick results. Um, so, access to good treatment, too, of a depth therapy nature. Finally, I bring it up, too, because to be told one has a, quote, mental disorder, basically because of genetics, some say, or because even partly of genetics, when it may only be 10% or less, is highly stigmatizing, or it is for the person receiving this stigmatizing diagnosis, especially if it's called serious, like psychiatrists and psychologists term schizophrenia and bipolar. Even to be called ADHD and have to, quote, have to take ADHD, quote, medications for a long time can be very stigmatizing, too. And this, not only a matter of stigma, but how it impacts one's income and social status and who one marries or not. So it's no light matter to be called mentally ill on a partly genetic basis. And further, to be told things are hopeless that you'll never grow out of it. Just give it up, so to speak. Just go to therapy occasionally to make sure you stay on your, quote, medications. And nothing else. Give it up trying to uh, to grow, let alone hope, hopefully come out the other end, perhaps, if you were once struggling. And so I don't have any definitive answers here. Um, access to care, too, can be quite limited if one even wanted depth therapy or to examine things in other than a, quote, genetic manner and the pharmaceutical manner. But at the very least, I think we ought to take a look at these issues once again. And I present my views from experience um, and from a person who has received psychoanalysis in their 20s from a rather renowned person, one of them too, a um, medical doctor and Jewish person in San Diego from a fine school I present all of this as my two cents worth and more of uh, my views. And um, while I don't know that um, it can be subject to test tube studies and double-blind studies, I hope it is good food for thought, and I wish you well.